OWCS Stage 1 for NA and EMEA may be over, but in Korea, things are just getting started. After four weeks of round-robin group play, we're ready for the next phase, the last Korea tournament in Stage 1 to decide who participates in the Asia playoffs, with the best performers going on to the DreamHack International LAN event in Dallas later this spring. Today, we'll be taking a look ahead at the OWCS Stage 1 Korea playoffs, but first and foremost, let's catch everybody up to speed with a brief recap of how the group stage went. After all, the matches went on for about a month, and there are games going on in other regions as well, so you may have missed out on some of the most important storylines that went down. Let's begin. First and foremost, nine teams went into the groups with hopes of making it to the next stage, but only eight were allowed to advance, and when it was all said and done, Vesta Crew was sent home packing. Sadly, a fairly expected outcome for most viewers, as they had the weakest looking roster on paper with the least amount of experience, and as a result, we'd see them get 3-0'd in all eight of their group stage matches, which is disappointing for sure, but hey, this was a good way to gain some experience and hopefully come back stronger for the next stage if they can make it back here. When it pertains to the top 8 teams that made it to the next stage, there were a couple of surprises to be had. First and foremost, when you look at the top, it's not Team Falcons. Whack were the ones to take home the top spot with an 8-0 undefeated record while only dropping two maps along the way. I, like many of you watching this, probably had Falcons as the number one team. They were the ones that were largely expected to have that type of stage, but in the end, it was Whack that most of the time were in control of every individual map that they were playing outside of a couple of outliers. And if there ever were moments where things were in doubt or up in the air, they were the ones to usually clutch up in big fights or show the better teamwork and or flexibility. And the usual suspects all did what you'd hope, Lipshu and Chorong were great, but the main storyline that has helped attribute to their success is the contributions being made by their younger players who had more questions coming into OWCS, aka Hisang, Junbin, and Max, the former Shock slash O2 Blast players. After a disappointing rookie season by all of them, I'd like to say, they went out there and showed that sometimes it's the system and not the player, as they looked like the guys that we were promised coming into their OW rookie years by all putting up significant performances in some major matches to help move the needle and become young stars in the process. This WAC team is no joke, and as of right now, they've toppled every challenge that has come their way, and they are the clear-cut number one for a reason. If you want to look back at their journey, I highly recommend watching back the FTG and or Falcons games. It's the only time they didn't completely and utterly dominate throughout the entire series. Those are the ones that are the most worth watching, but in the end, they showed they are the best. They're able to persevere over these teams and gain the upper hand. That Falcons game in particular had a lot of hype around it. It was the one that was circled on the calendar the final week. We'd been talking about it for a while. Who really is the best team? And in the end, WAC showed us exactly why they're on the top of the world right now. Early on, the match felt like it could go either way. There are a lot of interesting turning points with Falcons taking control early on, and then maybe looking at potentially tying Hollywood until Max had the play of his life on Sigma to turn around to fight and tie up the series, and the rest of the way through, it was basically all whack. They dominated on push, and it just seemed like they were in firm control. There were a lot of nerves early on in the series, as well as some confusion, especially on the side of Falcons, maybe because of that sudden patch with Mauga disappearing. It's a revolving door over there with the meta, so it's kind of understandable in a way, but Wack showed better preparation, better clutchness, and better teamwork. In terms of Falcons, speaking on them and not getting number one, it's disappointing, yes, but WAC are a really strong team, and there's still a lot of time for things to turn around. They still have multiple opportunities to play up against them and show that they are the better team. So Falcons fans, don't worry too much yet, but there are some things that definitely need to be improved upon. The issue with Falcons was, again, when they played the good teams, they just didn't seem like they knew what they were doing as much. It happened both in the FTG game and in the WAC match, two very close games that 
both almost didn't go their way. FDG was a really, really close one, coming down to a map 5, and ultimately depending on proper's antics and carry heroics to make sure that they didn't end up getting upset in that match. It seems that still, even though he's on a better team, sometimes it's still all up to this one man to go crazy and turn things around with his carry sojourn. But even so, there's no reason to hit the panic button just yet. This is a very loaded team after all. A lot of veterans of the game who are superstars at their craft. They just have to get through these meta issues and figure out a better system for their tank rotations. Maybe get some better performances out of them in the back line at times. And everything should be fine. They still were dominant against everybody else not named FTG and WAC. And there's no shame in that. So they'll still be one of the teams to watch. Nothing changes. They're the two seed in terms of the group stage, but they can still end up number one when it's all said and done when they get their potential rematches. And then rounding out that top three from the gamer were also rather impressive. They were the only team to push Wack and Falcons outside of those two playing each other, which is very impressive and goes to show that they are maybe a bit of an underdog as well. Outside of their games against Wack and Falcons, they only dropped one other map the entire time, looking pretty dominant across the way. Violet still looking like one of the top players at the support role, even after all these years is insane and justifies why he is indeed the GOAT. But they're also getting some good help from Bernard, who seems to be turning his career around for the better, playing some of the best Overwatch of his career. And then you have guys like Alpha Yi and Flora being able to show off on a better team, which is awesome. This team looks great, and if the meta bounces their way, they really could go all the way. This team is no joke, and they had some very fun games that are definitely worth watching back, especially the Wack and Falcons games. The potential is there, do not mess with these guys. Outside of the top three, not too many crazy things going on. The middle of the pack went about as you'd expect. It's interesting that Yeti got number four, but I think a lot of things bounced their way, which certainly helps. Honestly, the thing that influences how the middle of the pack went more than anything else is Genesis. A team widely praised by coaches and by some fans as well had them even as high as like third or fourth place. I thought they could at least be middle of the pack with the type of roster they had, but they ended up disappointing majorly for a lot of different reasons. And if they end up playing poorly in the last chance qualifier, I may need to make a what is wrong with Genesis video because how bad they're playing genuinely needs to be studied. A team with Decay, Choice A1, Kellen, and Kalios all on it ended up winning just a single game, that being against Vestacrew, which is not impressive at all. They went 1-7 in, in their groups and only won 6 maps the entire time. They were straight up getting 3-0'd more than any other outcome. But when considering that they have an inexperienced player playing main support for the first time in Teru, as well as not having a head coach up until recently, it kind of makes sense as to why things have not been going their way, and maybe with a bit more time they can figure it out, but with how abysmal their group stage was, I wonder if it's a bit too late for them. Aside from that, the standings are fairly normal. Most teams either over or underperforming slightly in that middle of the pack range. Some interesting results that happen with some of these rosters, though, would be Pokerface and Yeti kind of going on a bit of a hot streak to end the group stage, winning a bunch of games, while you saw Runaway lose a lot of games after having a strong start, showing that they're able to beat the bad teams, but they can't quite hang in there with the Elite. Generally, there were unfortunately a lot of 3-0s throughout every single week of the groups, but that's unfortunately to be expected when you're trying to weed out the mediocre from the actual good teams. To save you the trouble of navigating through this sea of dominance, there were a couple of interesting games that are worth watching back if you did not see what happened in Korea. Outside of any of the matches between the top three, I would definitely recommend watching Genesis vs. Runaway. That was a five-map banger where PH, aka Profit, had an out-of-body hitscan experience to help them come back down 2-1 and upset Genesis early on. Additionally, just last week, Runaway ended up getting upset by Pokerface in a five-map three where they'd get fuller held on Circuit Royale to lose in devastating fashion. And just like that, boom, you're up to speed. Let's take a look at what's to come now with the OWCS Stage 1 Korea playoffs that will ultimately decide who plays in the Asia playoffs to qualify for Dallas in a couple of months. 
So it's worth noting that the top eight teams from the groups are going to be separated into two different phases. The top four teams are all safe and they're automatically qualified for the six team playoff match, but they'll be playing each other starting this Friday to decide the seeding, with the top two teams actually getting a first round bye in this event. Meanwhile, seeds five through eight will battle it out in a last chance qualifier, with only the top two being able to move on and join the rest of the group for a shot at making the main event. So yeah, Runaway thanks to their cold streak as well as Genesis underperforming could be on the chopping block. Meanwhile, Pokerface and Sinpreza Gaming are just going to try their best to get through and prove themselves. You got two teams with everything on the line with two that have absolutely nothing. In terms of the general consensus and storylines and how to feel about these teams moving into this event, I'd say that for a lot of the teams I kind of already made it clear, but we're going to run through the list super quick. So at the top right now is Whack of course, they are the number one team. They didn't drop a single game. You gotta be feeling great about them because by definition, they should be the best team in OWCS career right now, if not the entirety of OWCS with just how dangerous this team is. Not to mention, they have great chemistry, they have an excellent read on the meta always, which is impressive with how crazy things are in Korea right now, but also one thing that I think really stands out that is underrated and underappreciated is the mixture of players they have. They have young guys that really want to prove themselves and people that generally just want to win alongside guys that already have one that still want to take it a step further, like your Lips and your Chorongs in the world that have won OWL titles. Them already is really good, but then you have Shu, who desperately just wants to be at the top after all these years, and three young Shock slash O2 players who want to take their game to that final level that still have so much left to prove, so much left in the tank. Sometimes that mixture helps make both parties move forward. The veteran guidance helps the young players, while the young players help keep the old guys sharp. Not far behind Whack though is probably Falcons and FTG. I think they both could very well be number one on any given day with what we've seen so far. Falcons in particular is kind of built in a similar fashion to Whack, where they've got the combo of the vets and the young motivated players. They've got it both going on. They just have to solve a couple of small issues. We see how dominant they usually are, but when the big games come, the nerves start to show at them, and that's something they have to get through. Not to mention this whole meta understanding thing. Maybe it's a coaching thing, I don't really know for sure, but they've got to stop with putting people on things they're not comfortable with and consistently playing the wrong thing at like the worst possible time. If they can get through those things, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to compete if not defeat Whack. They're going to be right in it as a favorite for sure. That's largely expected of them, and I think they could actually get better if they're able to fix just a couple of small issues. With FTG, I like where they stand. It's just a matter of if some of these players can finally take that last step above and level up to the point where they can play at that bona fide god tier superstar level. A lot of those guys have shown they can do it. It's just a matter of channeling it in a big situation like this. Maybe taking advantage of the fact that Whack and Falcons are feeling slightly more pressure. They've got to go out there and just do it. We need to see Alpha Yi and Flora go Super Saiyan 3 on those boys. That's what's keeping them from ultimately being that top team, and if they can just do that, they just might surprise a lot of people and end up qualifying for this main event. Then of course, I can't keep Yeti out of the conversation completely. They are the other team to make it to that top four, which again is very surprising just because I thought maybe a couple of other teams would be above them for the simple fact that they're more proven and they have a bit more going on. But thanks to some luck and playing well towards the end of the stretch, they were able to make it here, and depending on the meta, they can be very dangerous. It seems like right now you can get away with more dive in Korea, anything can change, but if they can get away with it, and we see teams continue to embrace dive, they'll be tough to stop. That's right in Donghak's wheelhouse, Knife and Viper look really good in like a Tracer, Sojourn, Tracer Echo setup. They have that locked down. This is a young team with a lot to prove, with not a lot of pressure, and that could take them a long way. As for the other guys, they're not so lucky. The one that kind of shocks me the most out of the teams in this bottom half is Runaway. They had such a great start, as I mentioned before. I believe at one point they were even like 3-1, and 4-1, and one, and then everything just went downhill. They played a couple of teams that are much better than them, and then they choked against Pokerface, which is not a great look. 
Poker Face have been overperforming, and they deserve some credit for really hanging in there with some of these better teams that they shouldn't be able to defeat. But the thing is, is Runaway have shown such better abilities overall. Choking this game is unacceptable, and it's gone to show us that lately there's been some inconsistencies with their game, maybe not always aligning with the meta perfectly, not being the most flexible team in the world, showing inconsistencies at DPS and with their backline, not being comfortable in certain situations. It's all kind of led to their downfall, and I think going on this losing streak could be really dangerous for them and could set the tone to have have them potentially get upset in the last chance qualifiers and not even make it to the next round. It's scary, but we also know what Runaway can do. When they were consistent early on, we saw them beat Yeti, the team that finished above them for that top four cutoff in absolutely dominant fashion. It was a convincing win. To say that they don't have it in them would just be completely wrong. It's just time for them to lock in, get a better grip on the meta, and have their players play with the consistency and the level of play that we know they can. As for the other three in this last chance qualifier, I mean, anything is possible. There's been inconsistencies across the board with all four of these teams. It's all about who shows up the most, and Poker Face just might be that team. Even though their roster isn't the most appealing on paper, they've been on a hot streak as of late. They've got some big wins over Genesis and Runaway to put them in this position to begin with. And right now with where the meta is at, it seems to suit a lot of their strengths, like with the Becky Echo, the tank play kind of stabilizing by playing more of the things that they're good at rather than embracing dive. They're in a decent spot right now, and if they catch a couple of these teams lacking, like they've been playing lately, they just might make it all the way as like the top seed from the last chance qualifier. It seems ridiculous because again, this roster doesn't scream amazing to you, but with how the rest of the competition is doing, it just may be them having to tiptoe around all the explosions to make it through. Then there's the teams you have the least amount of faith in, probably. SBG and Genesis, the 7 and 8 seeds. Anything is possible, but right now they feel the messiest for different reasons. SBG mostly because they don't have the roster strength. They only beat Vesta Crew in a struggling Genesis. They haven't done anything else aside from that. And then there's Genesis, who should be a lot better than what their record says, just knowing who they have. But with the struggles and the small amount of time they have to adjust, they might not have what they need at this point to advance far, to be the team that they should be on paper. I don't know how fast and how big of a difference a coaching change can make when it only happened recently. I just don't know, man. They can continue to play their realm of comfort, but if they're not on the same page, it may not make a difference. At this point, it's entirely up to them. With Decay and Choi Sewan leading the way, we know this team has a ceiling, and Korea thus far has had a main theme of consistent change. Maybe that change is finally about to affect them, after often being on the bad side of history rather than the good. Let's see what they can do. That's kind of my consensus on where these teams stand, the storylines following them, and the level of confidence and questions I have with them. This is what my power rankings looks like. This is how I feel about the pecking order. WAC have to be number one right now. They're simply the most proven team. They beat everybody they had to. There's just zero doubt about it until further notice. Then it's gotta be Falcons, FTG. Then there's probably a tier break in there. Those three are clearly a step above everybody else. But you may notice a couple of weird things like having Runaway above Yeti, despite Yeti getting that four spot. Honestly, because Runaway beat them before and I think they have the higher upside and I'm a bit more confident in them in a tournament situation, I like to have them number four, even if they're on a bit of a cold streak right now. And then later down the line, I do have Genesis over SBG. SBG did beat them convincingly before, but Genesis just feel like the better team and if they even play just a little better, they should be able to avoid that outcome again. So I'm going to reluctantly put them seven and not totally give up just yet. Looking into what I expect to happen with predictions over these next few weeks, with seeding deciders, even though it's not that important, I think WAC are going to take home the one seed, they're the best team, they have all the confidence in the cards right now, but then the two seed may be a bit surprising as I'm going with FTG over Falcons. This one's kind of a shot in the dark, but... I just have this feeling that Falcons are going to be a bit down on their luck after losing that game to WAC, especially if they end up losing to them yet again in this seeding decider. 
I don't know, man. They, they just have a lot of those players who end up feeling really beat up on themselves and losing confidence in their abilities when things go wrong. We heard about it with Gator on the Atlanta Reign last year. When they struggled, they just felt like it was the end of the world. And they have a lot of those same players again. I mean, they literally won midseason madness, but lost a crap ton of scrims beforehand, so they assumed they were just going to lose and go home. Like, that's the type of stuff we're dealing with. You have a couple of guys who can maybe help out with that, but it may just be overrided by the sheer number of players who are in that boat. It scares me. This team seems like they could be highly momentum-based. When things go wrong, they go wrong. When there's ups, there's great ups, but right now they may be facing a bit of a down. Perhaps this will all be for nothing. I'm overthinking, and it ends up being a false narrative. But history would suggest to us that it's very much a possibility, knowing the information that we do, so I'm at the very least gonna keep it in the back of my head. With that lower bracket last chance qualifier, I'm going with Runaway, of course, but then also Genesis for a bit of a spicy twist and upset. Runaway, I am a firm believer in. I have been for a while. I think they're going to figure it out and they'll get through. Poker Face, I think, was just a bad day for them. If they play each other again, I suspect that they would win. Runaway just have the talent, and I think they're about ready to go on a hot streak again, so I'm all in on those guys. But then with Genesis, I just feel like something crazy has to happen. It can't all just be super predictable with recency and whatnot. There's got to be some kind of interesting storyline. Maybe I'm overthinking things here, but Genesis seems like the perfect target. They haven't had any sort of luck as of late, but now they have a new coach. Everything's on the line. There's so much for these guys to prove. It'd be disappointing to lose this early on, so maybe they make something happen. That would leave us with Whack, Falcons, FTG, Yeti, Genesis, and Runaway moving on to the final six playoffs, which should happen after this week. And in the end, I am just going to pick Whack to win it all. Again, they're just the clear-cut favorites right now. I don't think anyone's going to stop them with how they've played. They have all this momentum. I get the feeling they're just getting started, too. They have so many guys with a lot of success throughout their years. And before Owl, a bunch of these younger guys like your Hisangs and your Junbins were great in these types of tournaments. I think they're going to ball out and they're going to get first place for sure. And in turn, they'll qualify for the main event held in Korea with all of the best Korean teams, Japanese teams, and Pacific teams later down the line to decide who plays in Dallas. And joining them, I just think it has to be both Falcons and FTG. Again, there's been a clear-cut tier break between those three and everybody else in the league so far. Don't see why that's going to change suddenly. Now, I got Falcons going on to that finals game just to lose to Whack again. You never know for sure, though. And then for that fourth place team, I'm going with Runaway. I've been a firm believer in them so far. Maybe I'll end up regretting that, but I think they have the tools necessary to at least make it to that third place match. And there will be a fourth team that likely joins from the Korea group. I mean, it's not a 100% guarantee, but whoever gets fourth, whether that be Runaway or like Yeti or something, they'll play in a wildcard match against the fourth place Japanese team and Pacific team, and in all likelihood, they should be able to mop the floor with them, and that should be that. There may be a small break with EMEA and NA, but... Don't fear, ladies and gentlemen, Korea still has our backs. There is a lot of Overwatch left to go in this first stage for them before a break. So get ready for some great action between some of the league's best. It's going to be a great time, and these next few weeks should be very telling on what the true pecking order of Korea is in this current state. That pretty much sums up how the last couple of weeks have gone, as well as what we should be expecting. So let me know what you think about the state of OWCS Korea right now down in the comments below. Who do you think is going to be the top dogs? Who do you think will surprise us? I want to hear all your thoughts. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to stay up to date with all the most recent OWCS tournament information and other content on this channel, I'd appreciate it a lot if you could give the video a like and subscribe to the channel if you're new. And until the next one, I'm out. Peace.